Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back to Imam Talk, where we corner uh, <laughs> current Imams to discuss about their own personal trajectories and their stories towards community leadership and also reflect upon the state of our community, the state of our masajid, uh, and what room we have to improve and what are some things maybe that we need some little, a little bit of introspection about. So welcome to the program, a good friend of mine, uh, colleague and uh, former classmate back in Medina, Ibrahim Khadr. Ahna wa sahna. So uh, tell us just a little bit about like right now, what's your official position, which masjid, what city are you at? So at this point in time, I'm Imam of uh, Roswell Community Masjid in Atlanta. I graduated December 2018, I think. Um, so I've been an Imam since January 2019, which is kind of sad to say that was almost five years ago. Yeah. Well. Um, but yeah, so Alhamdulillah, I was an Imam in Chicago for about three years and now almost two years uh, serving as an Imam here. Cool. So that's going to be really important because one of the things that we'd like to do is highlight sort of once you've experienced multiple communities, every community is very different. Some of the struggles are the same, right? But some of them are, are very different. But first, give us a sense of sort of what got you into studying knowledge in the first place. What was sort of your deal growing up uh, and how did you get the bug, so to speak, when it came to wanting to study knowledge and then eventually go abroad and study in Medina? Studying in Medina specifically? Um, Generally was, or specifically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was always like, um, yeah, I, I was always in the habit of trying to sit with shuyukh, especially for uh, recitation and Quran. I loved sirah. I used to sit down in the masjid and, um, you know, learn from the, the local shaykh in and, and, and Jordan. I lived in Jordan for, for a time. Um, How old were you when you were in Jordan? There were different times, so 10, 12, okay. you know, 70. So like, you were fairly like practicing like throughout your childhood? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Yeah, like I remember Sheikh Fayyad in uh, in Jordan, Amman. I used to go and sit in the masjid and after Fajr, I would just re read Quran Mashallah. and sit down and talk with him. And Mashallah. It was kind of learning through osmosis kind of thing. Um, so that was my exposure. My dad was very intent on if we were at a masjid like in Dubai, we lived in Dubai for a few years, um, go say salam to the Sheikh. Right, or he would put me in a camp with uh, with a bunch of other hafad and stuff like that. Um, and so, again, learning by osmosis and being around these people, that was that was kind of the vibe that we were going with. Um, and uh, regarding Medina specifically, like I really, really wanted to go while I was in college. Um, it's a common thing. A lot of people reach out to me, college students, be like, "How do I go to Medina?" So what was your, your major at that point, or what were you studying? Chem major. I'm okay. Chem, I graduated in a degree in chemistry. Okay. Um, I had tried and tried. It didn't happen. Uh, I actually remember 2011 RAS in, uh, in Canada. Um, I, uh, I went there with a friend of mine, and um, uh, Afasi was there. No. Oh, Mishad right Afasi. Yeah, yeah. And um, I walked after, after his program. I, he was like, you know how they have their like route that they go towards the the hotels or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I saw him walking and I was like, oh my God, let me go quickly say salam to him. So I went quickly said salam to him and I was like, Sheikh, I want to go to Medina, please make dua for me. Mm. And so he made a small dua that I get accepted and stuff like that. Uh, it took another three years and you know how Medina like, they ha it's there's no like one way to do things, right? You just keep yep. on doing. Apparently, they never even received my application, but I applied four years in a row, and then the fourth year, um, when I applied, I, you know, something happened, a big transition in my life happened, and um, I went Umrah in 2014, mm. um, and I had uh, one of the brothers, um, you know, he took me to the to the university. He's an older brother, works at um, uh, one of the uh, Islamic institutions out there, and, uh, you know, we drove to the, to, the, to the university, did the interview, and then six months later, I started getting messages on Facebook, you're on the list. Allahu Akbar. But what was it that, well, first of all, like, there's one thing that I noticed, and, you know, your story and Shafma's story and some other people, like, there's a common ingredient, I think, which is that being surrounded by, like, uh, an ecosystem that respects knowledge and ulama, and it's like, it's just like, this is what we're doing. You know what I mean? Like for Shahma, it was his his brothers and sisters, his like family, even though he was maybe like in Long Island or whatever he was, it's like he had a really strong family atmosphere, connections in the masjid. And so that was just, that was the expectation. 
And it sounds like you might have had a similar thing. Was that like throughout your family in addition to like, you know, the areas that you were living? Or was it just kind of, you know, like mostly from your, your father and like the massage and the mashayikh and stuff like that? Neither. This was a little more self-driven. The environment always welcomed learning Islam. And so my father, yani may Allah bless him, he said, I'm not going to stop you. I, I encourage you to do that. The main driver, completely, with complete honesty, was yeah. to be near the Prophet I wanted an opportunity to be near the Prophet At what point did you decide, I'm going to go study, like I'm going to do Talib al like this? That wasn't the construct in my mind. No. The construct in my mind was I want to live in Medina. Okay. I want to live near the Prophet. Okay. And so Talib al-Ilm was kind of like almost, you know, secondary to just being there. Is that correct or no? I wouldn't classify it as that. Uh, it's kind of like a 1A, 1B kind okay. of thing. Mashallah. So they're part and parcel with one another. I wanted to learn. I wanted to grow. But I didn't want to learn and grow to teach others. I wanted it for myself. And, uh, and I wanted, uh, again, ultimately it was that, that passion of, because the, the concept of ilm, when you immerse yourself in it, you feel like you're with the Prophet mm -hmm. right? When you're with the, the traces of the Salihin and you're like, you know, holding, you know, you know, the thread of clothing, you're like pulling it mm -hmm. and you're like on these fringes. It's like an escape of this world. And, and, you know, I worked at a lab and stuff, so um studied the secular sciences and all that stuff I, I didn't it didn't match it didn't match what i what i longed for and so you're you're the the talab al ilm is an environment that encompasses the smell of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so it's it's kind of like you're you're it's weird it's just like you know you want to just bathe in that and, and be near closer to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ultimately that's what it was and rectif rectification of the self and being in the city of the beloved so now you know as a, as a father of, of young children you know when you think about raising your children and you think about sort of <clears throat> the opportunities and the environment that you had are there things that you see that are continuities that you would like to continue like that you experienced and are there anything that or, or are there things that are maybe like things that you want to do differently when you think about maybe what environment do i want my kids to kind of grow up in yeah, I mean, um, so I'm very thankful for my upbringing and very thankful for my for my my father and, and, and mom. Um, I, I would say that like today's day and age is different than kind of what I went through, even though they are different. My dad, my dad really did try his hardest to make sure that we were immersed in an Islamic environment. Hence why we went to Islamic school for high school. Hence why we lived overseas for a time. We lived in Dubai, we lived in Jordan. Um, there was always that passion of saying, no, 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 I want you in this environment um, so that you don't lose your, your, your identity of who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something definitely that I would carry on for my children. And I would say that serving as an imam or going to Medina and learning, ultimately you do it for yourself and then you do it for your kids and then you worry about the community. Right. Because that should be the prioritization. Many people that serve others forget about themselves and forget about their families. Yeah. And you find that their children actually, because they, they felt uh, neglected in attention of, or, or focus of rectification and, and purification and goodness, um, they they missed out on their on their on their family. Yeah. Rather, everyone else had their family and they didn't, and so they act out. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and they, like, if I if I memorize the Quran, I memorize it for myself. And if I'm going to teach it to anyone, it's going to be my children, yeah. Tali and Jawad. I'm going to sit down with them and teach them. Um, and I wouldn't want anyone else to teach them. I want I want to teach them. So. So um, yeah, that's that's brings up another question. Like when you were studying in Medina, like. At what point did it occur to you to maybe get involved in masajid and imam work? Did it occur at, at any point or at what point did that become like, well, just yeah, maybe explain how did you make that bridge from going from a student of knowledge in Medina who's mostly focused on sort of rectifying yourself and immediately impacting your family to now being an imam? Um. 
you, you remember Sheikh Khaled, I forget his last name, but he was the one with the stick. Yeah, of course. When I went to Medina, uh, and I, I actually didn't want to stay. Khaled Al-Amin. Yeah, Sheikh Khaled. Okay. And, um, you know, I was, uh, Brother Abdul Wahab, he took me to talk to him. Um, and I was just like, maybe this isn't for me, da, 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 mm. I miss my family, my dad is sick. You know, Shaitan starts giving you oh, all these yeah. things, right? So it's like, let me go back. Most people, by the way, go back, they don't last. So Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, I take, I take pride in the fact that my personal pride or personal honor that I was able to go through the whole thing. Um, but, you know, he said to me one statement that still sticks to me today. He said, man your post. He said it very simply. He's like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you here, man your post. And I took it as a challenge. Mm. Um, so upon graduation, you've accumulated all this information. You've gathered all of this exposure. You've seen a world beyond the world that you have, that you've been in. And for, for Americans are, are kind of in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very insulated environment where they don't realize what the world really is. And then you get exposure to it. And Alhamdulillah, I was exposed to it already before, but this was to like a whole other level where I didn't have my parents to kind of go and talk to, but I was on my own. And, and so it's like, how can I bring whatever khayr that, uh, and goodness that I was able to, to kind of not gather, but touch? I didn't gather it, I touched it. How can I bring it back to my people? You know, and so... I guess it's kind of like just the natural course of things that it's like it, it goes that way. Plus, I was leading tarawih throughout the process anyway. Right. So it's a very so, natural sort of transition. Yeah. So I was leading tarawih before I went to Medina, throughout my time in Medina. And then um, and then it kind of just naturally just happened. Mashallah. So let's talk about, yeah, that transition. You make it back to the United States after you graduate. Tell, tell us about your first community. Um, what was it like? What was the composition like? Um, what are the, some of the things that you like struggled with what are the things that maybe were different because obviously our education that we get over there as essential and important as it is it doesn't 100 percent match up with uh community leadership right there's a lot of things that they don't teach us that you kind of have to figure out on your own or supplement in a different way so uh, tell us about that first community and your sort of experience as a fresh imam in some sense so it's interesting because I remember I sat down with some of the uh, older older shuyukh that have been around for a while, and I was kind of torn between two options that I was given, and I don't want to give names of where I went or anything. I mean, people, but I, I had two options. One was a lot harder, and one was a lot easier. And when I spoke with some of the the mashayikh, they were like, "Take the one that's harder and prove yourself. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere." That's what they said. What was harder about it? The size, the burden. Bigger, so the, so the more community, responsibility. A lot more responsibility. So, and a lot more, it wasn't like a pocket. It was like there. And you know, the institution that I went to is the oldest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the first masjid in Chicago. It was the first masjid there. And it wasn't just one masjid. It was two masjids and and a school and like a bunch of other stuff that were kind of like accessories to it. So you need to be assimilated into something that's already got a history and identity. It's not like you're going to come in and necessarily leave your stamp on it in the same way yeah. that you would for like uh, a brand new mesh tea that's just like, you know, just started. Exactly. So you're literally diving in the deep end, first and foremost. And it was a challenge. They told they told it to me. They're like, I dare you to do it. Mm, the Shaykh, may Allah bless him, he said it like that. He said, I dare you. So I was like, okay, Bismillah. Because in my head, when they say it like that, they're saying, I know you can do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And don't settle for less. Right. And so I made the intention and I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for help. And subhanAllah, you know, I, um, you know what's funny is I, I found Ahl al-ilm, the people of ilm, were always there for me and always had my side. On the side of the 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 principles morals and content but the siyasa right. the policy of people uh i relied on my father and the people that were there the elders that were there um one person that i consider a mentor and a friend um, you know even people that i worked with that were part of the institution and uh, brother habib qadri he was i consider him a mentor um, he used to call me shaky shakes right um, 
I would rely on him and I would annoy them so much. I'd pick up the phone and talk to them and say, hey, this is what's happening. Sit down and get some lunch, Peter. in. If you ever go to Chicago, get some Peter in. Um, and so that I, sure, they weren't shuyuch. Right. But they had, they had the exposure of people. And they were, they were definitely people that I rely on. And even here, um, there are brothers and sisters here that, you know, that, that are elder, older than me in age. I rely on their, uh, their guidance. Can you think of an example? Like, let's, let's imagine that you and I are sitting down with a young Medina grad or, you know, a Medina student, and they're about to go back and be an imam. And now you've got to, like, tell them these, whatever, if people want to call them soft skills or CS or whatever, that you're not going to learn there, that you have to learn from people. Like, what's an example of, of something? Christchurch. So, remember I tore my ACL in Medina? I do, yeah. Um, it was miserable. <laughs> yeah, you weren't the only one. Big Bash also did it as well. May Allah, may Allah protect him. May Allah I give mean. him shifa. But yeah, I tore my ACL there, and then I ended up doing the surgery in Chicago. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, I can I can run again. Um, but it was literally the week after Christchurch happened. Mm. Now, uh, you know, this is like I'm literally on the bed with the machine that's like moving your knee and all that stuff, and I'm like, what is going on, mm -hmm. right? I pick up the phone and I talk to these leaders. I'm like, what are we doing? What's going to happen? And North Chicago has a very dense, excuse me, Jewish population. And they themselves are like uh, worried about the whole white supremacy thing, yeah. right? Because they had uh, the, the I think it's called right? the Tree of Life. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. In Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. yeah. So th they had similar situations. And there were people that are already part and parcel of, of the community and they were like, let's, let's do a vigil. Now that's the natural response. We're going to do a vigil in the masjid. And um, I'm like, okay. I speak with uh, the, the, the people that I consider elite in knowing how to manage community situations. I'm like, listen, vigil is something that from a, from a content perspective, we don't agree with, nor do we endorse, because it is a ritualistic behavior that has uh, pagan traditions rooted to it. However, people are grieving and they don't know what to do in this situation. So now we're faced, and on top of that, you have these people that want to gather on that. And, you know, it's something that it took a life of its own. So what do I do? So what I did was I spoke with everybody and then I, I looked at my options and I said, okay, um, the news is going to be there. There's about a couple thousand non-Muslims that are coming to the masjid. This is like a big deal situation. This is a big deal. It's not like a small, 40 people are killed on camera, right? This is not, this is not something where you can just brush to the side. Um, they're going to be there anyway. The situation is happening on its own. Yeah. And I spoke with Habib about it. And basically, the vigil, it was called a vigil. Right. But it was in reality just a gathering. And there were a lot of non-Muslims and they came and showed solidarity, solidarity and support. And the news was there and they were all there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and I'm still literally in crutches, um, and I wasn't going to miss it. I can't, like, you hired me as the imam, I have to be there. This is, uh, as we say, a stance of a man, where you have to stand up and, and, and face this, despite the situation. I think even in American culture, uh, um, uh, was it Franklin Roosevelt who had polio? Yeah. And then he would make sure that he looked like he was standing? It's a similar situation where you, you have to stand up, forget about your pain, put that to the side. And, and I was in so much pain. I had to even go up the steps and I was like literally struggling um, to get onto the, the stage. So attended that, but I cannot lose sight of the fact that I'm an imam and this is a Muslim institution. So how do we grieve as Muslims in a situation like this? We do what we can for the siyasa of people, but then we come in and say, okay, the element to do with the Muslims and the grief of the Muslims. And this is a Muslim situation that's happening. I'm not going to lose sight of this, nor am I going to politicize it in such a way. It cannot lose that, that, uh, that, that purity. And so I looked into our corpus and how we handle these situations. How do Muslims grieve in such situations? We performed, uh, we decided to perform Salat al-Ghaib. This is, by the way, before Mecca, Medina, and Al-Quds did it. Mm -hmm. So I announced to the community that the vigil is going to happen in the gym, and in the Musalla, after Maghrib, we're going to pray Salat al-Ghaib. Uh, a very Hanafi community. Right? <laughs> yeah. And the Hanafi opinion on Salat al-Ghaib is that it was something specific for a Najashi. Yes. 
However, the other opinions they differ, and each each madhab has an approach to this this um, this issue. Um, and this is a very Hanafi community as well. However, I know that everyone is dealing with this, like this touched people in a very different way. That Muslims were slaughtered on camera in the most ugly of fashions. Um, and so I announced to the community that we're gonna uh, we're gonna do it like this. There were some people that said, "Oh, this is not the Sunnah." Blah blah. blah. I'm like, "There's a difference of opinion." And if you want to talk, let's talk. Inshallah, we can discuss. However, I didn't go outside the bounds of our 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 tradition, and I went with my crutches to the front of the musalla. A couple hundred people were still in the musalla, and I told them, "There is a difference of opinion. If you don't want to pray with us, that's fine." But there is a situation here that requires a different outlook. And I gave them the different opinions of the madahib. And I said, inshallah, the janazah is four rak'at. We face the qibla and we perform the salah. And uh, literally less than a handful left. Everyone else stayed. We prayed salat al-ghaib. And um, it was like a coolness of my heart that the next day, Masjid al-Aqsa, Mm. Masjid Nabawi mm-hmm. and Masjid Al-Haram all performed Salat Al-Ghaib on those mm-hmm. brothers. Mm-hmm. So um, that was something that felt, I felt, Alhamdulillah, like I, I felt guided by the guidance of my elders and, and, and my, my teachers and my, my father and yeah. my loved ones that helped me in, in, in that kind of thing. And that's, that's imama. It's a mawqif, it is a stance of hazm, of, of leadership, of, of strength where you... Where you you have to be the one to say, I got you. Mm-hmm. And people look to you for leadership. If ilm didn't give that to you, then where did you, what was your ilm supposed to benefit? We're not supposed to hide in rooms. Ibn Qudama rahimahullah was there with Salah al-Din on the day of Safin. So, or Hittin, sorry. He was on the day of Hittin with Salah al-Din. And so that's that's the ulama. MashaAllah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a wonderful illustration. Um, Especially of things where you know your elders and mentors can really save you and just extend, obviously, the little bit that, that we know. Um, they give a whole other sort of dimension to it and amplify everything that we can do. But as your first community, there's no doubt that you also made mistakes, right? And there's probably things that you regret. Um, let's talk about those. Like, what are some things that if you know um, now that you know better? Right, you'd be like, "Wow, it's like okay, next time around, I'm gonna do this in a different way," or "I really wish I had I hadn't gone about it in this way." Um, I, I didn't. I wish I didn't insulate myself the way I did. Probably should have been out there, out and about with the people a little how, more. How did you insulate yourself, and why? Like, what was sort of going through your mind? Like, you just didn't so, wouldn't like show up to show so to social things with like Heba. Or like, what was it? No, it was more like uh, and and organically. So I learned it organically over over time. But like um, like one of the, the biggest issues of being an imam is people want to talk to you after Aisha. Yep. When you have family and stuff like that, you know, it, and I, I don't know, this is like one of those things where I'm still learning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say that... Uh, Work-life boundaries is very difficult. Exactly. Now, you ask yourself, you know, you, you're strict on those boundaries, but what harm did that do? You know, and maybe I could have done it better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wish I, um, I, I wish I reeled in my own personality a little bit, and been a little bit more balanced in my in my leadership. And that's something again I'm still working on. Yeah, all of us. We all have our own personality, and it's part of leadership is to kind of rein that in and not necessarily let your personality rule how you're going to dictate, rather deal with people with with wisdom. Yeah, and that's a really good point because, you know, we were just talking, you know, off camera when we were getting coffee (laughs) before we came here about how you might love somebody, but your personalities might just not go together. And so it's like, you need to find a way that's some almost one of the more challenging sort of situations in leadership. It's like, how do I be a leader to this person and still sort of give them what they need, but it can't necessarily all the time be me or I have to like manage my own personality around them because just the way we are, <laughs> our personalities kind of clash. You know, it's a really interesting thing. I think, you know, from my end, you know, one of the things that I learned the hard way was a, a, a similar thing about access and, and boundaries. You know, I was so idealistic, I think, going into it um, 
and even naive where, you know, like everybody had my phone number. I was basically on call like 24 seven and that just wasn't sustainable, you know, and some people didn't respect it. Right. Some people would, um, you know, uh, not have the proper etiquette when it came to reaching out, you know, things that really weren't important or they weren't following protocol. They were trying to get to me to skip over having to go to the person they really had to go to. Right. Um, almost like pitting you against maybe the board or, or something like that. Sometimes, like sometimes that happened, or just yeah, just people demanding access to you like twenty four seven, and it's it's challenging because you have your family life, you have the things that you have to do for the community, you know, your chutzpahs, your classes, your your etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You have your other sort of networking that you have to do with the other local faith leaders and masajid and etc. There's just so many different components. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's um. Pe- I think that people often don't realize that when they reach out to an imam, for what they think is like a little question, you know, that person might be very overwhelmed, and that person might have like literally a million other sort of like three hundred people literally at like demanding something similar of them, you know. So that was that's sort of something that I ha- I've been learning to to navigate. Anything else uh, come to your mind of things that or. Um, or if not, talk about the transition to the new community that you're in now. What are some of the differences? Because communities are very, very different, um, and they pose unique sort of opportunities and challenges wherever you go. So just kind of like going back on your point, there was one thing that I forgot where I saw it, but it was very relevant, is uh, if you want to be a good leader, um, and a good um, anchor and, a, and a, cent- a center of gravity for the community, you need a balance of two things, competency or competence and warmth. So I tilt more on emphasizing competence. And because there is sometimes that deficiency of, deficiency of warmth, someone who maybe I never even got a chance to interact with, they just saw me walking by and they're like, why is he so mad? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it's literally because I left the room because I was just talking to someone about suicide. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it's like ha- th- this is like the it's like an age old, century old kind of conundrum of how do I manage this? And at the end of the day, we're human and, and young, and I feel like the elders have done a better job at mastering it. Yeah. Um, so you know, as far as putting up boundaries and people reaching out and and there was uh, one situation where you know, he, yeah, there was that badgering, um, but then I realized that the person was struggling with something, and and you feel guilty. You're like, well, yeah. you know what? I, yeah, the guilt know. is huge. And so, like, I'm a little more forgiving after all these years. Um, and uh, you know, that's that's what I try I try to be. Now, moving transitioning into a new community. I, I tried to learn fr- from my uh, um, from my past experience and build on it. And that's that. You know, part of part of what you have to do transitioning into the community, you do have to adopt a little bit of what's going on in that community, right? So, for example, one community may be very strict on noise that's happening in the musalla, right, yeah. no talking, right? And and I completely understand that. And then another community. They have what يعني مؤلفة القلوب, right? Their hearts are يعني يعني you you wanna so that doesn't work there, and so you probably do have to entertain the conversations and sit down and stuff like that. So that that kind of transition I I I picked up on it, um, and part of the blessing of of being in Chicago was the two messages that were part of that one umbrella organization were very different, and so I'm literally like going between two that are very very different. Um. Now, going into the new community, I, I tried to learn from that mistake and was like, I embraced uh, certain cultural elements of it, certain ones, not all of them. And other ones, I feel like you have to also be the one to rectify. Right. You do have to, you know, part of, uh, part of our, our belief system is الامر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر. We call to good and we also forbid things that are wrong. Um, I think one thing that I'm learning now in trying to do better at is an nahi al munkar is a process. Mm, mm. It's a sequence. Yeah. Right. It's not and just one point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes, yani, 
you would, you're giving advice and people kind of take it the yeah. way they wanted to hear it. Of course. Which is not what you said at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, you know, you're simply kind of alluding to something and then it turns, it, it takes a life of its own. So you kind of have to be a little more wise in that regard. And that comes with, that comes with, uh, um, that comes with trial and error, which is what we call experience. Experience is just trial and error. And a lot of failing. A lot of failing. A lot of failure. Yeah. yeah. Fail, for, fail forward, as they say, right? Exactly. All right. So give us, um, let's talk, let's switch from talking about the personal sort of um, aspect to the institutional aspect. Okay. Mm -hmm. We live in an era where a lot of people complain, and rightfully so, about being unmasked, right? That the mosque is not a hospitable place. It's not a welcoming place, especially for the youth, especially for women. Um, some people have given up on the mosque. Some people have, you know, tried to create third spaces. Some people haven't given up quite on the mosque yet, but they're in the trenches trying to fight and, and think about how we're organizing and running our mosques. What are, what are some of the biggest struggles that the institution of the mosque faces, especially from your experience and what you've seen? So I told one of the brothers here that for, for board members really to, to know what they're doing, they have to practice what Harun al-Rashid used to do, where he would dress like a commoner and walk in the streets. Put yourself in the shoes of the people. See what they see. Some people will come and say, well, you know, we're a donor-driven masjid. And the donors want this and the donors want that. That's not, that's not our way. Surah Abasa disagrees with you. Surah Al-Kahf, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ Disagrees with you. Nuh alayhi salam, he didn't care what the donors thought. He built the ark and they made fun of him. Yeah. yeah. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the elite of a people are the ones that are tested. Right? That there's a particular sort of thing that comes along with being of the elite that actually makes you vulnerable to a certain type of test. Yeah. And so the advice is to rectify our affairs and to be more sincere and renew our intentions and to purify our hearts and to, you know, one of the beautiful uh, characteristics of the Prophet وسلم, is you couldn't tell him apart from the people. Yeah, right, right. That was in his physique, yeah, right? Rab'atan bayn al bashar. Uh, he was, he was, like he wasn't too tall and he wasn't too short. Inshallah, you know, like I can tell you apart. <laughs> when we're doing tawaf, I know exactly where Tom is, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of us are dealing it with comes the. Comes in handy. You know, for you're tawaf. in the stratosphere. It and we're comes just, in handy for tawaf. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Everyone knows where Tom is. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the Prophet وسلم, was. So he was in the middle, and that, that had a, a hint of accessibility. And on top of that, he knew what the people were, and there were descriptions that if people would throw a thobe, mm -hmm. a piece of cloth, over the, the, the brothers and sisters, well, the brothers, in, uh, in the time of the Sahaba, it would cover them yeah, because right, of how right. close they were with each other. And you couldn't tell the difference of who from who. Um, and so, like, like one of the examples, he was sitting with Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, and they were like, which one is he? Right. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's very important. Omar and his slave, right? Exactly. Right in the Philistine. Sadly, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so th this is like the advice that I give to these people. Y you being a board member is not a privilege. It's not a privilege. It's a responsibility. And that responsibility is not to steer what the big bucks are saying. Yeah. Uh, it's to steer the cause, the cause that there are people that are struggling that we want to work for the collective good. We want people to, to feel a sense of warmth in the masjid. Um, what, the, it's interesting because the stakeholders will claim uh, warmth, but then the stuff that they're promoting is pushing people away. Right. Because like they what? don't feel like they belong. What, what do they, they push that push that pushes stuff people away? When there's an overemphasis on the walls and the building. Right. And, Facilities over personnel, over programming. Um, even the programming, the nature of the programming, it mm -hmm. tends to be a little self-serving, right? Where it's, it's promoting what we think is important. Mm -hmm. But then these people are struggling. It's like a whole different language. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, it's, there's a balance and you want to kind of address everybody. You want to deal with everybody. Um, everyone is important. Everyone requires da'wah. Um, but that's the thing. The masjid has to be da'wah. Um, so you meet people where they're at, and 
you know, again, people, some, some institutions fall for the trap of illustrious uh, um, badges, you know, and look at what we are and look at what we do. But it's not about you. Interesting thing we were looking into is uh, a comparison. We were doing this for Halaqa for the Sisters, actually. This was today's Friday, uh, Wednesday. It was Wednesday. We did a Halaqa for the Sisters on Al Unsu Billah, finding joy in our Salah, finding joy in our Ibadah. One of the things that they say is you have to purify your heart. And part of purifying your heart is looking at the things that matter. One of the things that matter is the strength of your Iman and not the abundance of your deeds. Right. Uh, then they give us the example of Abu Bakr and Umar. Which of them was better? Abu Bakr. But which of them did more? Umar. Umar did more for the Ummah. Ibn Mas'ud he says, we didn't pray near the Kaaba until Umar accepted Islam. He was Khalifa for 12 years. Now it's not, they're not mutually exclusive to say one is good and one is bad. No, they're both good. There's good in all of them. But then when we look at, you look at the, the effect, there was a mass effect of what Umar did versus a little more specific effect of Abu Bakr. Not to say that Abu Bakr didn't have his moments. Right, Abu Bakr, he protected this ummah from Ridda. Abu Bakr, he uh, he was with the Prophet Sallallahu and defended the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did a Even lot. Even from just a, a a quantity, you know, perspective, he didn't have as much time, right? Exactly. As Umar radiallahu. Exactly. Yeah. So the so the abundance of action and the abundance of good did not equal better. Right. Right. Exactly. So, so. When we look at that and we say, okay, just because a masjid or an organization is pumping out like a bunch of stuff and then they'll have their their big dinners and they'll have their presentations and this and that, look at us, look at us, look at us. They don't realize that most people are like, well, okay, you guys are all the way up there in your ivory tower. Us masakin, I don't belong here. Right. And you can get the mayor in and you can get the politicians in and everybody can be whatever, but... That doesn't mean that you're actually doing what Allah wants you to do with. They're this. chasing for relevance made them irrelevant. Yes or no? Um, what should be the metric then to judge a masjid whether it's being successful and, and fulfilling its proper role? If it's not like being extremely well financed and having like a big say in the community and rubbing shoulders with the politicians and the, the really influential people, what are metrics that we should judge a masjid whether they're succeeding or not? It depends on what it's for. Like you can't, like I can't impose the word success on something where it's not even looking at what I'm looking at, right? So you have to come with a statement of what it is that you want to achieve. And before diversifying into so many different things, you want to hone in on what makes you, you. And this is personal as well as an institution. And so we gather on a kalima. We gather on a phrase that is our direction, is our... Uh, if the word is prerogative, right? That is the thing that we're going to look at. That is the horizon that we're going to face. Now, whatever good comes along the way, Bismillah, MashaAllah, having the politicians has its place. Having the people of, of affluence, it has its place. There's da'wah for both, and there's necessity for both. Um, what are you trying to accomplish? Right, that's the question. So I guess, you know, your mission, vision, right? And and your your your... Yeah, your purpose and your objective, these things you want to clarify them. It's a bit, these are business terms, but they, there's, there's wisdom in it, right? If, for example, my institution is, no, I'm not my, I don't have an institution, but let's say I have an institution and my institution's focus is, uh, you know, our brothers and sisters who are incarcerated. If that's my focus and whatever uh, accessory helps propel that, such as relationships with the government, such as relationships, whatever, that works for that cause. Does that make sense for me then to focus on, say, for example, a, uh, um, you know, having having a retreat for social stuff? Depends on how you frame it. Yeah. If it's something that funnels it in, or is it just a standalone thing, right? So are you doing like a, just a gazillion things, or is it honed in on a on a, on, on a horizon that you're looking at? That's really profound and I think really important because, you know, we don't suffer from a lack of masajid. I don't think. Most places in the United States. We have plenty of masajid, plenty of buildings, plenty of places to pray. Though that wasn't always the case. It, it kind of is now for many, many people. But everybody's trying to do everything. Where in reality, you know, it one way to sort of, I think, redeem 
the situation where everybody is just trying to be sort of the king of their own castle and their own little sort of thing that doesn't work with any other masjids, right? And uh, just we lose so much in reinventing the wheel, in not collaborating on programming or, you know, God forbid, finances or anything like that. That's almost like a way forward, right? If you imagine, um, imagine one metro area and instead of having, well, you have the Pakistani mosque and the Bangladeshi mosque and the Arab mosque and this mosque, it's like, well, this mosque focuses on converts and, and dawah and, you know, like whatever. And this mosque over here focuses on charity work. And this mosque over here focuses on the youth. It's all just like youth programs, right? It's almost like a competitive advantage, but it's, we're not competing with each other. We're actually then like creating an ecosystem of religious nonprofits where life is better for everybody because now uh, you have higher quality sort of things that are going on. And You're concentrating the efforts in different yeah. pockets and stuff. Like That's that. really, really interesting to think about. I think it's idealistic. Um, I'm idealistic. Mashallah. Uh, just the nature of people. You know, there's always an ebb and flow of how, how to address these things. But proof to your point, um, an example of a very more anecdotal approach to it is Zakat al-Mal. Uh, and I'm a very like... I'm very strict on that because personal stories of people who went through uh, foreclosure, people who went through homelessness, people who went through surgeries that broke them, right? And and it's like I, I never. Uh, you have people that are millionaires. Why yes. are people suffering? Yes, exactly. Right? And that shows a mismatched prioritization. Your neighbor, your neighbor, the Prophet Sallallahu he says that Jibreel keeps telling me about my neighbor until I thought he's going to inherit from me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, salam. And so people are praying next to each other side by side and one of them doesn't know if they're going to be able to pay their bills the next month yeah. while the other one is sending to God knows where. And fine, there's khair in it. Is it, is it mujzit? Meaning that is it something that... So the masjid, a lot of masajid don't have the capacity to to distribute zakat al-mal, rather they gather it and then they don't know how to distribute it or they don't have the facilities to distribute it. And I think Dallas has um, a uh, an organization, I spoke with one of the mashayikh and he said that there is an organization and they give the majority of their zakat al-mal to that organization and they are uh, specifically for distributing zakat al-mal. That's it. That's what they, that is their focus. And so a masjid that you know, does not have the capacity, acknowledge your weakness. Yeah, exactly. Acknowledge your limitation. You don't have to do everything. Exactly. And give it to these people. Because it, it, what, what matters more? That you do it or yeah, that it is done? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the fact that it's done. Khalas, let them do it. Let's Sheikh Abdullah used to always come back to that exact thing when judging our sincerity. He's like, judge yourself. If you're sincere, are you as happy to see your brother do it? Mm. Or does it have to be you? Exactly. That, that has to do it. And that goes to Dawah, that goes to programming, that's whatever. It's like if somebody comes, if we have a program or we have a khutbah today. Today in Atlanta, you give a khutbah, I give a khutbah. Someone comes, like, yeah, I didn't go to your khutbah, I went to Ibrahim's. Like, he's, he's prettier. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> I am prettier. Yeah, <laughs> <Mashallah. No play. laughs> yeah, alhamdulillah. You know, it's like, you know, I should be happy for you, you know, and happy for that person. It's like, I'm glad I got, I'm, I'm glad you got what you needed, you know, because, I agree with because Ibrahim's got a different style than I do. You know, like I can get lost in my my thoughts and my theories, and I'm very idealistic, like like you know, right? So if Ibrahim speaks to you and you're vibing, I'm happy that you're that you you found someone that speaks to you, and it's not going to be like, oh, what's what's Ibrahim doing? It's like maybe I'll go through all of your Shake It Up podcasts and find that little slip up that you made, and I like that plug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to be on Shake It Up tomorrow, inshallah. So inshallah. you know, this is a nice little crossover we're doing. Let me let me give another example of that. Eight rakahs versus twenty rakahs. Right, 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 right. Okay, which one is right? Which one is wrong? Neither are right. Neither are wrong. Yeah, yeah. It is what it is. But let's say, for example, one master is doing twenty, and another master is doing eight. Exactly. Why does the one that's twenty talk down on the one that's doing they eight? They shouldn't. It's a bouquet. you have to do twenty for your salat to be valid, and blah 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 blah. No one said it's valid. That's right. No, yeah, you can do whatever. It's the numbers arbitrary. Right. We all, everyone acknowledges this. Some finish the Quran. Some don't finish the Quran. I think that's variety. It is what it is. So, so let's say, for example, one masjid is doing eight for the purpose that most people are, are going to pray eight. Ninety-five percent of people are going to are going to leave after eight. Right. Why not give them the barakah of, of of also listening to the witr? Yeah. And they'll stay for witr. Right, they'll right, pray right, eight right, and right. they'll pray the witr. Yeah. The other masjid, they're going to do twenty. They're not going to do a talk in between. Okay. If that's what you like, that's what you like. Yeah. Ahlan wa yeah. And if this is what you like, ahlan wa Why do they have to be 
like why does one have to rule over the other and they all have to be unanimous? Yeah, we're all, same it team. It doesn't make same any sense. Same team, bro. Same team. Exactly. Now, how many that we, we have? We that. have a lot of friendly fire going on. Yeah, too much friendly fire. Oh, always. No, we have that in Utica, alhamdulillah. Like, for example, we have some of the Bosnian masajid and, you know, we work with them on as on stuff that we need to be doing more together, unfortunately. But that's one thing where, you know, when it came to, when we were building our new facility, we were praying Tarawi with them. Yeah, so we, we did a joint thing. And so the Imam and I would, like, switch off every night and they do it in the Turkish style. They recite very little. <laughs> I had never seen the Turkish style. Like, whoa, this is all, you know? Uh, and so we did it. It's great if you have work the next day. It was like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, so much time. Um, but then once we, alhamdulillah, like, you know, got our facility completed and now we're back in our facility, we're like, well, how should we do Tarawi? It's like, well, they're doing it this way. Let's do it a different way. Mm. That way, there's gonna be people who have to wake up super early and go, and especially we're in a northern latitude, so if Ramadan's in the summer, whew, it's like night is very, very short. So I'm not gonna hate on you or look at you funny if you go to the one that's shorter and you get back and rest and whatever. And if you got more time, you can come to us. Maybe you go there on the weekdays and us on the weekends, like that's great. And in fact, I think there's more brotherhood than that. And I think that there's more sort of, um, you know, nasiha in that, like loyalty, you know, like from one to the other. Yeah. So we can approach many things like that, programming and sort of, you know. Sadly, people turn these things into like teams. Yeah. And then, you know, they, and then it turns into like an interesting kind of uh, fragmentation. Yeah. In yeah. Yeah. I, heard, I overheard, I'm not going to even name the city because people will know which one I'm talking about. I'm not even going to name the city, but one. Once upon a time, I was in a city and I overheard somebody say to the Imam, man, we're the only masjid in X city on the Sunnah. I was just like, and the Imam was allowing it to happen. That was the problem too. The Imam sets the tone when it comes to these sorts of things. It's like, that's first of all, factually not true. Um, and second of all, that's a really poisonous attitude to have. It's like us versus them, competition. Like, like no, we're all the same team, bro. Friendly fire. Friendly fire, man. Yeah, I, uh, you you actually mentioned uh, up, uh, upstate New York. I was in uh, Finger Lakes during Ramadan in twenty, what was it, twenty seventeen? Ithaca, Rochester, where are we at? Uh, Finger Lakes. Oh, the the town of Finger Lakes. Yeah, oh, okay. Horseheads. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And uh, very beautiful nature, but my God, we were finishing Tarawih at like yeah one, and Fajr was at three thirty. Yeah, yeah. That was not fun. No, that's the northern latitudes, man. But hey, in winter time, come back in winter. I mean, yeah, like but you're, you're like fasting two hours, you know, <laughs> <you're> chilling. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so. Um, alhamdulillah. Well, we're, you know, we have to go both give khutbahs, so our time is, is drawing uh, to a close. Is there any other sort of like final thought or anything that you'd like to add as a reflection? Um, whether it be to maybe people who are watching, some people might be on boards of Masajid or students of knowledge that are looking to one day consider do imam work or just your average musalli, right? Uh, your average person who is, you know, attending a masjid and maybe doesn't know how to feel about the way, the other ways in which people are doing things at the masjid down the street or the masjid on the other side of town. Like, is there any sort of final thoughts you'd like to leave them with today? Yeah, I mean, so uh, there, there's a few, inshallah, that we can we can touch on. And my focus is on tulab al uh, once you once you taste it, you're never gonna want to let it go, and so don't ever ever let it go. Always always crave more. Um, the Prophet ﷺ was not commanded to ask for increase in anything, except ilm. Everything else you don't need it. Ilm is your thing, and that is you're never ever gonna have all of it. And so you chase after it and chase after it, and part of it again is tabarruk. That you are, yani, if you're not like the, if you're not gonna be like the Salih, then at least act like him. Yeah. If you're not gonna be, at least learn about him, right? And uh, as Imam Shafi'i said, right? I love the Salihin, but I'm not from them. Perhaps I can find in my love for them a Shafa'a. Um, don't lose who you are. When you when you graduate from Medina, you're now a different breed. You're now different. You're not the same as the rest. You have been given an opportunity in Medina, Azhar, wherever, right? When you have uh, aspired to acquiring knowledge when everyone else turned their back, you're not the same. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, لا يستوي القاعدون من غير ولي الضرر والمجاهدون في سبيل الله. 
And so this is your talab, talab, right? And once you've tasted it, don't turn your back on it. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, may Allah have mercy on this person. If he started Qiyam al-Layl, if only he had continued it. Um, and so don't lose who you are. And whatever you benefit, do not use it to disprove, do not use it to argue, do not use it to, to, exactly, use it for yourself and your own rectification. Use it for yourself and your, and your own betterment because فَاقِدُ الشَّيْءِ لَا يُعْطِي And, you know, ال, ال, the Imam or the Alim or the Talib is like a marker. A marker that has uh, in it like ink. When you put it in water, it's going to change the color of the water. But eventually it's going to lose its ink. And so you need to replenish and you need to replenish. Otherwise, you, there, people are going to take and not give. And you're going to lose it, and you're going to be colorless, and you're you're going to be empty, an empty vessel. And so, retract yourself for a little bit, gain some, have a word that you're reciting of Quran every single day, have a metan that you are yani, that that you want to master, um, learn something new, read articles, read maqalat, uh, which is articles in Arabic, read, uh, um, uh, have a book that you read, have a portion that you read, never lose that part of you. Um, and then, lastly, yani, when it comes to working in masajid and this and that um, it really does go back to one thing for the if you want to reach the unmasked if you want to reach the one who is struggling if you want to reach the rich and powerful if you want to reach the poor and and and, and struggling um, have one thing that matters above anything else and that's the example of the prophet وسلم, is that he was loved he was loved you want to leave that imprint that this person loves me. Even the one that I ideologically differ on the most fundamental of basis, at the very least, I can say, he's a cool guy. I just disagree with him. I can't help it. Mm-hmm. If that is the one thing that you are successful at, and that is connecting with people to the where they can't say anything bad about you in the sense that, like, I, I don't fundamentally dislike him. I may disagree with him, and that's normal. Our personalities aren't the same. al mujannada. Right, this is fine, but at the very least, I can say, yani, he left a good imprint on my heart, and uh, emphasizing the memories is more important than emphasizing the information. Um, when we talk about good teachers and bad teachers in Medina, right? Do we talk about the information? No. I don't. I don't remember the statements that they said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just remember the feeling I had when they taught us. Sheikh Adil Khudaydi, Sheikh Ibrahim al Shimmari, Sheikh Saud al Muhammadi was amazing, right? Um, uh, Sheikh Ala al Din al Mashur, these Mashayikh. When they walked in and they interacted, what was something that was jamir of these people? Students loved them. Yeah. And everyone speaks good about them. What did you learn? I don't really remember. Maybe I'll remember a statement here or there, right, but right, I right. remember how I felt. Being cognizant of that and working in communities, if if you are loved, the board, when they gather and talk, at least when they talk about you or with you, they respect you and they love you. If you're with the musallis, they respect you and they love you. If they're with the people that you, know, you disagree with them, at the very least you can say, listen, you know, we don't vibe in that sense, but I, we're cool. Yeah, right? mashallah. Great place to end it. We know you have to go. I have to go. We ask Allah uh, to rectify our affairs and guide us. Amen. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Al